Hello, my name is Peter. I'm a senior design consultant at Clark. We're a systems integrator based in Atlanta, Georgia. I'd like to welcome you to the camera setup and engineering breakout session. Today, we're gonna to talk about cameras, specifically studio cameras, how to set them up, how to white balance, black balance, color balance, and color match. Although we're, we've only got one camera here today, the principles behind color matching multiple cameras are the same, so we can walk through that process. Now, before we actually build the camera, we need to pay attention to the tripod. The tripod needs to be set up correctly because it's the foundation of the camera. If your tripod is not set up correctly, or if it's undersized or oversized, it's not gonna work, or you're gonna fight it the whole way. So let's jump in. I've got a tripod here. It's a Cartoni Focus 22. There's lots of other tripods out there. This is the one I like. This is the one we're gonna be using today. Once the tripod is set up, whether it's on a platform or on the floor, the very first thing that you need to do is make sure the head is level. Almost all tripods from any manufacturer are going to have a leveling bubble, which is right here, on the tripod. It also, many of them are gonna have a light, which helps you see the bubble a little bit better. If the tripod you own doesn't have a bubble level built in, you're gonna to have to use an external, like a little bullet level or something like that. And when you do, you wanna make sure that you're leveling both in this direction and in this direction. Since this tripod has a bubble level, it's a whole lot easier and we're gonna use that. So, like I said, there's a little light here, allows you to see the bubble. Underneath the head, right down here, is a knob. You're gonna loosen that up and what that does, it allows the tripod head to move around inside of the bowl, which is what, uh, what, the, tripod, what the head sits in. It's almost like a, uh, like a cup, and then the bottom of the, the, the tripod head is a bowl, and they fit down in there, and then it gets screwed down tight. So to balance it, you unscrew it, turn on the little light, get the bubble right in the center of the circle, and lock it down. Lock it down nice and tight, make sure it doesn't move, now we're ready to mount the camera. Today I've got a Sony 3100, but what we're gonna look at today is not specific to this camera. It really applies to any studio camera out there. I've already got this camera kind of built up. A lot of times what we would do in the field as we're setting up cameras is we would put the lens on the body, we'd mount that to the tripod, and then we'd sort of do all the rest of the build up. But since I've already got this built, we're gonna go ahead and mount this directly to the tripod. When you mount your camera, you want to make sure that you hear that click before you let go. Last thing we want is to take one of these cameras and just dump it on the floor. So now that the camera is mounted to the tripod, we still got a little bit more balancing to work to do. So we know now the camera is level on the tripod, but it's not yet balanced. In order to balance the camera on the tripod head, it's really important that you have the full kit built. And what I mean by that is you need to have the lens on, you need to have all the cables on, you need to have the monitor on. If you're using uh, Simpty Fiber, you need to have that on. If you're using just BNC cables directly out of the camera, you need to have those connected. If you're using rear controls, you need to have those connected with their cables and set in a position that's comfortable for you or whoever's operating the camera. The reason why that's important is because we're going to adjust the center of gravity of the camera on the tripod. So it's important that all of the weight is distributed where it's gonna be while you're operating the camera. Now that we've got the tripod head level, now we need to balance the camera. It's important before you begin balancing the camera that you've got a good hold on it. I like to hold the handle. Sometimes if the camera's really high, that's not super comfortable, so I'll just grab the camera like this. But it, it, however you grab it, you need to have a good grip on the camera. So first thing, you want to loosen the tilt lock. Now, if I let go of the camera, it's going to fall forward. All right, that means there's too much weight forward. We need to move it back. So this lock here unlocks the slit. Now, this slides back and forth on the tripod. And what we're trying to accomplish is for the camera not to fall forward or back when it's in a level position. Once we get that, we can lock the slit. Now, the reason I say it needs to stay when it's in a level position is because if I tilt it forward, it's gonna fall forward. If I tilt it back, it's gonna fall back. Now I just noticed it falls back a little bit slower than it falls forward, which means it's just a tiny little bit front heavy still. So we can just sort of tap it back a little bit like that. 
get it level, tilt it down, tilts down. Tilt it back, it tilts back. Leave it level, and it stays level. So now we're ready for the next step. And so now we move on to something called counterbalance. There's a spring inside this head, and as we crank up that counterbalance, it's compressing that spring. That compensates for the weight of the camera when it's in a tilted up or tilted down position. The way to set that is take your camera, tilt it forward. Again, we're gonna to wanna to hold on to it. And then we're just gonna start turning, turning this dial up. And what you're gonna notice is you're gonna to get to a point where the lens actually starts to tilt up just a little bit. And don't worry if it takes a whole lot of turns to get to that point, that's quite all right. So now I can let go of this camera and it stops right there and turn it just a little bit more. If I keep turning it, this camera should start tilting up. So now the camera's balanced on the head. We need to check it. What we're looking for is the camera to be able to stop in any position. So if we point it down, it stops. If we point it up, it stops. Now the tripod is both level and balanced. This is gonna give your camera operators, whether professional or volunteer, a whole lot easier time operating the camera. The other thing that this allows is now for you to be able to use the friction to adjust how the tripod feels or how much resistance you have either moving, panning side to side or tilting up and down. If the camera's not balanced, you probably already know that you've gotta crank this up just to keep it from dipping or raising up while you're shooting. So I usually, when I set a camera up, I like the tilt to be a little bit tighter because when we've got a band on stage or pastor speaking, we're not doing a whole lot of tilt up, tilt down, but we are doing some panning. So your tilt drag is here. I'm gonna set that around six, so I've gotta give it a little bit more force maybe than I would otherwise. And then pan drag is down here. So wanna make sure that the pan lock is loosened. Okay, that's set at about six right now. And I feel like that to me might be a little bit too much. So I'm gonna dial it down to about four. Now it's a really smooth pan and it's a little bit tighter tilt. It's important that once the camera's balanced, you explain to your operators, they're able to set the drag on both the tilt and the pan to where it's comfortable for them. The other function of both the tilt drag and the pan drag is to smooth out movement. You don't get this jerky start, jerky finish. It's a very nice kind of slow ramp up, slow ramp down because of the resistance that's there. So now we've got our camera built, we've got our tripod set up, it's balanced. It's level, so we're ready now to start setting the color and the look of this camera. So I'm gonna be using today a uh, DSC Labs chart. This is actually a book, and I carry this pretty much everywhere I go, whether it's uh, freelance directing gigs or setting up cameras, commissioning. I always have this chart with me. This allows me to have a grayscale. It's got a color chart, pretty much everything I need. There's also a back focus chart. We're gonna talk about back focus here in a minute. That would be that. And then there's this chart, which I really like. Once everything is set up, you can show this to the camera and this gives a close approximation of what skin tones are gonna to look like. All right, now we've got the back focus chart set up across the room. We've got the camera focused in on it. We've also added this camera here so we can see what's going on on the RCP. And we've also got the scope connected. You can see it up there. You can see the image. And we're just about ready to begin our back focus procedure. But before we do, it's important that we open up the iris on the camera completely. The reason why it's important that the iris is open completely is because that is the point where you get the absolute shallowest depth of field. Having the shallowest depth of field is important when we're doing a back focus because we're actually adjusting the focal plane from the back side of the lens to the sensor and having the shortest possible depth of field is gonna allow us to see the exact point where that comes into focus. Today we're using this focus chart from DSC Labs. You may have seen this before or you might be familiar with the circular star-shaped sunburst looking chart. Either one will work fine, whichever you have is great. Just know that it's extremely important 
to do your back focus. If you don't do back focus correctly, what happens is on one side of the lens, on the telephoto side of the lens, if you focus and then you pull back, your shot will no longer be in focus. For photography guys, you guys are used to focusing in between each shot or getting the framing that you want and then focusing. In the broadcast world, studio cameras, these lenses are what are, what are called par focal, meaning once you set your focus, it stays in focus from the telephoto side all the way to the wide angle side, but we have to set that. Now we're gonna walk around to this side of the camera. On a broadcast lens, you're gonna find a little thumb screw on this side of the lens. Don't get confused with the macro ring. The macro ring has an M on the end of the adjustment. You kinda have to pull it out and then you can spin it there. That's not what we're doing. The thumb screw over here is the one we want. Now right now, we're zoomed all the way on on the chart. We've got the iris all the way up. It's a little bit bright. So I'm actually gonna use the ND filter wheel and I'm gonna drop in to the second filter. Now it's a little bit darker. We can actually see a little bit more detail. So I'm gonna focus this up as good as we possibly can. And you can sort of see they're right in the center. When you get it dead on, they just kind of pop the centers and then they'll go away. So we're looking for that spot right there where they, they pop. Now we're gonna zoom the lens all the way back. We're gonna loosen that thumb screw. Now watch what happens. I go all the way one way, it's out of focus. Go all the way the other way, it's out of focus. What we're trying to do here is get it right to the point where that chart is in focus. Now it's a little bit hard to see because it's so far away. It's usually a little bit easier in the viewfinder, especially if you have some sort of focus assist. But that probably looks like the spot where we're closest. Now what I'll do is tighten the thumb screw, but not all the way tight. Just kind of gently pull it down. And we're gonna go in and we're gonna check, make sure are we in focus? And we're gonna start slowly pulling out. Is it staying in focus? It looks like it is. And it is. So now we've done the back focus and we're ready to move on to white balance. This is probably something you guys are all familiar with. We need to do it as part of the setup for this camera. I'm gonna go change the chart, be right back. Now that we're done with the back focus, we're gonna reset the camera and get ready to do a white balance and a black balance. I'm gonna take this ND filter out, go back to filter number one, which is clear. And we need to set the iris. And we're gonna do that by looking at the scope. Today I'm using this scope, runs on my Mac. It's called Scope Box. You can see the output up here on this screen. It costs about 100 bucks and it only requires an input device. So today I'm using the Blackmagic Ultra Studio Mini 4K. You can use an AJA UTAP, you can use the Blackmagic uh, Mini Recorder. Pretty much anything that takes SDI and gets it into your computer will work. So let's jump in. First thing we need to do is set the iris on the camera and we do that by looking at the scope. If you look at the scope here, we've got the chart. So this is the picture that's actually coming from the camera. Here we've got the vector scope. This displays color. This is a waveform monitor set up in a RGB parade. This is gonna allow us to see white balance because we're actually looking at the red, green, and blue channels individually off the camera. And this side is a waveform monitor also, and it's set up to show basically all three colors in one composite image. We're actually gonna use this window right here to set the iris. Before we do that, the chart we're looking at is an 11 step crossed grayscale chart and it produces a very specific pattern on this waveform monitor. Now what we're looking for as we start to bring down the iris of this camera, we see now it gets really dark and it's really low. If we bring that up just so those top pieces hit 100, now the camera is properly exposed. Now what we're looking at here is each one of these is one step on the grayscale chart. So this side, the top goes white to black. So that's gonna be this side, white to black. The bottom goes black to white. And similarly, we've got black to white. For the first part of this setup, the waveform monitor is what we're gonna be concerned with. So both this window and this window. Now you may have noticed already that the red, the green, and the blue 
don't match, meaning they're not all three sitting at 100%, which is where they should be. That means that our camera needs to be white balanced. Before we do a white balance, we wanna do a black balance. Always do a black balance first. So we're gonna come over here to the RCP and we're going to hit this button here, which is the auto black button. When we hit that, you'll see the picture goes away. What's actually happening inside the camera is it closes down the iris and it's going to make all the adjustments to the black level so that the black levels, red, green, and blue, are all lined up on that zero line. Takes a few minutes to do, so we just have to wait for it to finish. And there we go, it's done, it's complete. And now we can see red, green, and the blue is kind of hard to see, but it's right there. But the reason why it's there is because this is all stretched up because the white balance is off. So now that we've done a black balance, we're gonna go back over here, and right next to the black, it says white. That's gonna be the white balance. Now when I hit this button, I want you to watch the parade, and you're gonna see them level out. All right, so now we can see they're all leveled out. But we can also see that now we're above 100%. So the white balance actually pushed us up just a little bit. So we're gonna reset the iris to where those white chips, so here and here, these white chips here, are touching 100%. Now we can see that is a well white balanced image. Before we're finished, we're gonna do a black balance one more time. So we've done black balance, white balance, black balance. Now we're gonna go back and we're gonna start setting some levels. First thing we need to do is get black, black. Now on the chart, you've got these black chips and they're supposed to represent black. However, when you shine a light on that chart, these still are going to reflect some light. It'll be a small amount of light, but they're still gonna re reflect some light. So if I were to come over here and take the bottom of the, the image of the chart and bring it all the way down to zero, that's gonna affect my saturation of colors. And I'll show you that here in a, in a few moments. So the way you wanna set black level before you go on to the next step is by closing your iris. That's gonna be absolute black. There's no light hitting the sensor. You're gonna open up and now you can see what's happening. As I raise it up, these lines are going all the way up and the picture is getting gray. So what I wanna do is bring it down to where the lines are sitting on that zero mark. Now when I open the iris back up, set it to 100. Now we're ready to move on to the next step. Now we're gonna jump into color balancing the camera. I've already gone ahead and changed the chart as you can see behind me. This is the DSC Labs Chroma Dumond chart. It's a different version of one that you've probably already seen. The one that you're familiar with is most likely the one that has the color chips along the outside edge and a crossed grayscale here in the center. This is a new version of that chart, but it shows the same pattern on the vector scope. They also have these charts in smaller formats, something like this, little disc format. These are great for setting up cameras, but you have to be relatively close to the camera to be able to use these. This one is not going to help you at all to color balance your cameras, your two center line cameras, your one center line camera that's 40, 50, 100 feet away from the stage. It's just gonna to be too small. But having something like this in your backpack or your, you know, your, your kit, it's a good thing to have. Just like the crossed grayscale, this chart is designed to produce a very specific pattern on the vector scope. The last chart, the crossed grayscale, we use to set black level, white balance. Now we're gonna use the vector scope to address the color. What you see here, each one of these dots represents one of these colors. Now, we've got a grayscale here. We're not gonna worry about that. We've got this blue, green, and red, and then this cyan, magenta, and yellow. We're not gonna worry about those either. Those are for a Rec 2020 color space, and as you can see, you've got one of them way off over here. That's gonna be that full yellow. There's another one off the screen over here somewhere that's gonna be this blue, so on and so forth. So as we look at this chart, we're gonna notice some boxes placed around the chart. They're labeled with letters, R for red, M for magenta, B for blue, so on and so forth. 
These are our targets. So what we're trying to do is get each one of these colors inside of its target. We do that by making adjustments to the color matrix. Before we jump into the color matrix, it's important to understand what the matrix is doing. There's actually two different matrices. There is the color correction matrix and there is the linear matrix. The difference between the two is that the linear matrix makes broad adjustments. So for instance, if we were to make an adjustment that affected this area, we would be adjusting all of this one direction or another. The color correction menu or color correction matrix allows you to grab one specific color and move it around. So I could grab hold of just this red dot and move it wherever I wanted. The application for something like that is going to be shooting commercials. Let's use Coca-Cola Red, for instance. If you're shooting a commercial, that red has to be the exact right Coca-Cola Red. And we can accomplish that using the color correction menu. But for color balancing and for color matching, we want to use the linear matrix and only go into the color correction menu to make very small, very specific adjustments. As you can imagine, if you grab hold of this dot and you start moving it one direction or the other, it is going to affect these other dots around it, but it's not going to affect them in a smooth, uh, visually appealing way. So we can see on the scope here that we're fairly close to where we need to be. Green is right in its target, cyan is right in its target, yellow looks good, blue looks pretty good, red and magenta are really where our biggest issues are. So we're going to try to focus on them first. So we go over here to the RCP and we're going to call up the matrix menu. I mentioned before there's two different matrices. There's the linear matrix and the color correction menu. Different camera manufacturers call these different things. In this particular camera, the Sony camera, it's called the user matrix and the multi matrix. The user matrix is the linear matrix and the multi matrix is the color correction menu. So we're going to start in the user matrix. So before we begin making adjustments, we're going to go ahead and zero out all of these controls. So All right, so now we've set all of the matrix adjustments to zero. And I'm gonna go over here to the preset. Now, I can turn this knob and we can see how different presets are going to affect the color. And what we're looking for is a color that's as close to the targets as we can get. So we're just gonna cycle through the different presets. And that actually looks pretty good. So that's, that is the Rec. 709 preset. Majority of the time, that's what you're going to use as your starting point. There are some occasions, different cameras, where one of the other presets may actually look a little bit more like 709, even though it's not Rec. 709. So now we've selected our preset. We're going to go back over to the first page of the matrix, and we're going to start making adjustments. To make adjustments in the matrix, we want to make as small of an adjustment as possible. So the best way to do this is go through each one, one by one, making small adjustments, watching the vector scope to see what it's doing, and start molding that shape into uh, a more circular, almost hexagonal pattern. That'll make a little bit more sense as we start making adjustments. So R slash G, red into green, G slash B, green into blue, B slash R, blue into red. So that's how we say these, that's how, uh, that's how they're known. So I'm going to start making this adjustment here. If you watch what happens on the vector scope, it starts to expand. And that's probably too much. So we're going to bring that back down. Right now I'm looking at my red and magenta. And that looks pretty good. So now I'm going to move on to the next one. So that is pushing uh, magenta and blue out too far on the saturation. So we're going to bring that back till it lands right there in the targets or close to them. And we're going to make our next adjustment. And if we 
go in the positive direction, you can see it stretches it out. Yellow and blue become way too saturated. We're gonna move that back in. Now we don't wanna go too far because this is also affecting the red. So wanna keep red in its target. Now what you'll notice here on the scope is that yellow and blue are outside of their target, but they are on the correct vector. That's why this is called a vector scope. So if you can imagine from the center point a solid line going straight out to the target, that's gonna be the vector, okay? This measures saturation. So from the, the point from the center to the target is how saturated it is. If you get off of that line out over here, that's the phase of the color. That means you're actually not the right color. So what we try to do in a scenario where we just can't hit the target, we either don't have enough adjustment or we're pushing it just a little too hard, is then we say, all right, it's okay to miss the target, but I really need to be on that vector. I need to be on that line so my color is correct. It just might not be quite as saturated as it should be. So going back to the adjustments here, as we're adjusting blue into red, we can see that that's stretching it out way too far, but it's also changing the position of the red. So we're gonna bring that back so that red is directly on its vector. You'll notice that both yellow and blue are on their vectors as well. They're just oversaturated. So we're gonna to go to this next page here and we're going to start making adjustments. As we can see, that's pulling red and magenta out too far. So we're gonna come back to there. Now they're both in their targets. Red is slightly oversaturated, but we can fix that. We'll move on to our next adjustment. And we can see that that is bringing down red and magenta. So we're gonna put that back. That's not the adjustment we need to make. We're gonna go on to the next one. And that, as you can see, is sort of spreading everything out. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna use that to make our blue and yellow less saturated. Now, as we're doing this, you can see that there are some other colors that are being affected as well. Now, I will say this as a point of reference and also just a little bit of advice. One of the things that we always have trouble with in our churches when we're shooting is blue light from an LED. It gets oversaturated and blows out you know, the, the, the chip way, way before the picture is properly exposed. We can adjust for that by desaturating blue, by purposefully pulling it back a little bit. The other thing that you wanna be concerned with, if you have LED lighting, is yellow. Under LED lighting, the yellows tend to be a little bit more pronounced. So again, we can protect for that by bringing yellow a little bit less saturated. Still want it on its vector, but we can make it less saturated. So we're gonna keep going in the negative direction until we get right about here. So we'll need to go back and fix magenta, but now we've got yellow and blue and they're correctly on their vector, but they're slightly desaturated. As you notice, since we've made that adjustment, green now is a lot closer to its vector, cyan is a lot closer to its vector, yellow, blue, and red are dead on. We need to do some work to magenta. Before we go on to that, I just want to make a quick point about green and cyan. Those two colors, you really don't need to worry about. As a general rule, we don't make adjustments to green or cyan in terms of saturation. They will almost never hit their targets, and that's okay. When they do hit their targets, it actually looks a little bit weird, especially under LED lighting. So let's go back and we'll try to hit, uh, see if we can get magenta a little bit better. So we're gonna go back again to the first menu. Remember, as I said earlier, we're just gonna keep going around in a circle, going around in a circle until we get that looking the way we want. So this adjustment is gonna bring red back down into its target. And go here and see if we can push magenta up. It's gonna bring blue a little bit closer to its vector. And there we're stretching yellow and also magenta is getting closer. Next page. And we're just gonna continue 
going through, making small adjustments. Every adjustment affects the other, so it's not enough to just do it one time. Now, it looks like in this camera, the only way we can get magenta on its vector is to have both yellow and blue in their targets. And that's okay. And we'll show you how we're gonna fix that in just a moment. All right, so we're pretty happy with that right now. Uh, we could spend a little bit more time, massage it a little bit more, but in the interest of, uh, of time, we're gonna stick with this. What you'll notice is yellow is right in its target, red is right in its target, magenta, blue. Cyan is not quite where it belongs, but it's close, it's very, very close. And then green is actually kind of, kind of off a good bit. But we can go in and fix that. This is where we wanna jump into color correction menu or uh, the multi-matrix as it's called here in the Sony camera. So we're gonna choose our color with this little phase dial here. And right now, if we look at it, we are selected on blue and you can see what's happening. As I start to move just blue, this dot in between here starts to get elongated. That's what I mean by color correction changes, the, changes the, the overall picture, but it does so by adjusting a really small area and everything else is sort of secondary to that. It gets pulled in one direction or the other. So I'm gonna put that back down where it belongs at zero. And I am going to come down over here and try to find green, which I think should be right there. Yeah, so we're gonna move green over onto its vector. And then I'm gonna come over here and take that dot that's between green and cyan, and I'm gonna move it in between green and cyan. And then I'm also going to adjust the saturation just a little bit so it matches more closely with the saturation of the other two. But I'm not worried about hitting the target or going all the way down. So now, like I said, we can protect blue and yellow. So if I come over here, grab the yellow, and just bring it down ever so slightly. And then we can do the same thing for blue. Just bring its saturation back a little bit. And I'm pretty happy with that. We could obviously spend a little bit more time and tweak it and massage it a little bit more, but this is a really good place to start. This is really close to where we want it to be. These dots here represent skin tones. That's these two patches and these two patches. Clearly, these are not the only four color, you know, the only four skin tones, and they're not necessarily exactly like a skin tone, but they're a close approximation. Why I mention that is this line right here between red and yellow is what they call the flesh tone line. Now, depending on uh, you know, complexion of the person, the lighting conditions, this may be stretched in this direction or this direction, but for the most part, it's gonna be right here. Those flesh tones are going to be right there. So if you've got, your know, dots are all down here, then it's not saturated enough. If it's way out here, it's way too saturated, just like all the other colors. So that's something you want to pay attention to when you're making adjustments, particularly to red and yellow. So the next step would be to match other cameras to this. And the way we would do that, I'm not going to go through the entire process. We don't have another camera to match, so uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't be super helpful, but we would take a snapshot of this image and then we can overlay it on top of the next camera. And then it's just a matter of moving the dots so they're directly under that overlay. It's almost a paint my number situation at that point. Once you've gone through all your cameras, you've got them to match. We've got the hardware leveled and balanced on the tripod. We've white balanced, we've black balanced, we've set the back focus. Now we're done setting up the camera. The next step, if you want to, is to adjust the camera color for a particular look. So this is a standard broadcast Rec. 709 look. You may wanna do something different for worship. You may find that you just don't like the way this looks on your pastor or on your stage. This is the point, now that all the cameras are matched, that you can go through and make those adjustments that are creative in nature, where you're creating a specific look. And just like before, you'd go through one camera, get it set the way you want, capture that image, and then just paint by number all the rest of them. So now we're completely finished setting up this camera. 
Now we sped through a good bit of information today. We talked about setting up the tripod, balancing and leveling. We talked about back focus for the lens, white balance, black balance, color balance. We talked about how to match multiple cameras and we talked about being able to create different looks depending on what you're trying to do. This is a very in-depth topic. We could spend hours more talking about this. If you've got questions, I'd love to hear from you. Just go ahead and post them down in the comments and we'll get right back to you. Again, my name is Peter and I'd like to thank you for hanging out with us today.